Did you know there was once a flume that ran from high up on Mount Elphinstone all the way to Langdale? The flume carried cedar shingle bolts floating in water from the mountain to the ocean. Did you know about the large logging camps that were scattered all over the mountain? Trains on rails and pole tramways carried people, supplies and wood in and out of the forest. Homesteaders and early settlers built their homes on the mountains close to where they worked, cutting trees for lumber, shingles and even masts for the huge sailing ships that brought new settlers and their belongings here. As the forests were cut and new communities were built, the camps and early homes were abandoned and left to be taken back by the forest. The forest doesn't waste any time. New trees quickly grow where others have been cut and entire camps and homesteads are swallowed up by the vegetation that grows so quickly here on the coast. Not 30 years ago, there were buildings right where these alder trees are. Now the alders are the only sign that there was ever anything here. The wet rainforest decomposes the wood and now, unless you look carefully, you won't see the history for the trees. I'd like to take you for a hike up Mount Elphinstone. About 450 meters up, there's a dam sitting on Chaster Creek. And this dam was the source of water for at least two flumes that ran down the mountain. From here, the flumes ran down into the Bay and Gibsons and also down to Langdale Creek. But to start this hike, we'll start down at the Sprockids Bike Park. To get to the Sprockids Mountain Bike Park, go through the lights at the top of the bypass to the ferry. Turn left when the road turns to gravel and park across from the gate. So here we are up at the Sprockids Bike Park. Now, this particular site used to be the garbage dump for the whole lower end of the Sunshine Coast and it was closed uh, in the 80s and then it's been converted into the Sprockets Bike Park and we're going to start here we're going to hike up through this gate and up to uh, the sign it has a map it shows some of the trails that uh, access the mountain some of the trails that the mountain bikers are using and uh, then we'll head on up to the dam site okay let's go you can come too okay so I just thought on our way up we'd just take a quick stop and have a look and see what's in the pack. I did take some precautions before we left. Uh, I did let somebody know where we were going and uh, I did tell them when I would be back. I've got a whistle, that's a, my emergency locating device and I've got a bear bell just in case uh, we en encounter any animals on the way and they'll know we're there. That's important. I've got lots of food for the day. I'm just uh, on a little day hike and this is uh, enough food to keep me going for, for a while. I got some halva. I really like that. It's yummy. Uh, some fruit snacks, uh, a couple of different granola bars, um, a little bit of gorp, uh, a couple of cookies and some an orange just for a snack. And I've, I've got lots of fluids, water, and I got some Powerade too. Um, emergency equipment. I've got a space blanket that'll keep me warm and dry if I need to. Got a first aid kit courtesy of the Credit Union. Thanks, Credit Union. It's just a basic kit. It's got uh, a couple of band-aids in there and a couple of gauze pads and some tape. I took along a piece of flagging tape uh, just in case. A little bit of TP, measuring tape, uh, flashlight. I got a warm pair of gloves and a warm hat and I got a rainproof hat too. I brought my cell phone. Um, don't rely on a cell phone on the Sunshine Coast. You may not be able to get a connection. It's better to have your whistle along with you just in case. And uh, I picked up a copy of the Sunshine Coast trail map as well. So I know where I'm going. I'm prepared for the day. I got a good raincoat. I got sturdy shoes. And I like to hike with a stick. It just helps in the real steep spots if you're on anywhere slippery for getting up and down. So that's my pack. Uh, I'm ready to go and, uh, and the other thing is I'm not hiking alone. So up the hill from the, from the sign, if you keep climbing up and up and up, you'll eventually come to this little kiosk that's got this map on it and it's got some of the basic trails. But uh, we're, we're here right now and this orange area is pretty much the site of the, the bike park and where the garbage dump used to be. We're going we're gonna to hike up this trail here which is called Technical Ecstasy until we reach this intersection where, where it's called Upper Flume and then we're going to follow all the way along this trail called Sidewinder, over Gibson's Creek, following the flume, over this little creek here, and eventually up to Chaster Creek where the, the site of the dam is. Now, this is one of three fairly recognized routes to get up to the dam site. There's the Technical Ecstasy Sidewinder Trail. There's the Cablevision Trail, which is, I wouldn't recommend it, it's really steep. If you drive up to the top of Keith Road, you can 
walk up the trail, what they call the Boot Hill Trail here, eventually joining onto this trail. And then also from the top of Keith Road, you can hike the historic cemetery trail or the tramway trail, which will eventually get you up to the dam site as well. But this is the easiest way to get up and it's the most historic for me because it follows the flume and we'll have a look at the flume or at least what's left of it on the way up. Here we go. Okay, we're about uh, three minutes up the trail from where the sign was. And this is the intersection where the lower flume trail, technical ecstasy and sidewinder all join. And it's actually the first place you come in contact with some of the remains of the old flume. And you know, it doesn't really look like much. And in a lot of cases, the old flume looks a bit like this. It's made of cedar that you can see some nails in, in here and there's a nail over here. Uh, the whole flume area is, is collapsed upon itself. But this flume ran from Langdale up to the dam site. This was built in the early 1900s and it was built by hand. Every one of these boards was split. It's been out here for nearly 100 years and in some cases the wood's still in really good shape. And it's funny because as I hiked past here, I had a look up and I realized that this post here, and I've hiked past this post dozens and dozens of times, this post was actually one of the towers that held this flume up and the flumes actually collapsed off the towers but if you look right at the very top you can still see some nails sticking out there so uh, this piece still stands and it's solid as a rock okay as you can see by the sign the intersections of the trails are really well marked uh, this one is uh, sidewinder now we're heading up and it follows the flume all the way up to the dam site just about you could actually walk the flume all the way up to the dam site uh, except for a couple of creek crossings and a slide or two you can uh, walk right along the flume line. You have to get a little bit muddy and you'll be crashing through some bushes, but we're gonna take the trail. It's an easier walk and we're gonna follow the trail at this point with the blue markers. Off we go. Okay, this is just off to the left of the trail, just about 30 seconds up from where we just last stopped. And it's a good example of a piece of the flume that's still fairly well intact. You can see the, the rails that ran downstream the cross members down below and this is one of the upright posts here that held the whole thing up. There was a series of planks that ran on top of this and they held water. Shingle bolts went firing down there in the water. It's like a giant water slide. You have to really keep your eyes out if you're going to hike the flume because I hiked past this support tower numerous times and I only just discovered it last year and it's not 30 feet off the trail. It's uh, one of the only intact support towers. It's complete, it has to, both its cross members, both the uprights, and there's even a support rail going down. And you can see the downstream rail again coming down from the top. And you get some idea how high this, this piece is. I stand six foot, it's probably a good 12 feet high. And the, and the nice thing is the cross member across the top is still there too. So this, this tower's intact. It's right off the edge of the trail and it's a, uh, Quite a neat uh, little part of the flume. We're going to go another 50 or 60 feet down into the bush and uh, there's an even better example of the flume towers down there. Okay this is the tallest towers that are left on the flume line. There's uh, two or three towers just above that are kind of collapsed but I'm just going to go down here so you can get some idea how high this tower really is. Remember this flume ran at about a two percent grade all the way down the mountain and uh, they didn't want the, the logs to go too fast. So they had to keep that grade straight at, at about 2%. So they sometimes had to build these towers really tall. This is uh, one example of three sets of towers on the whole flume line now where there's more than two towers connected. Two towers connected at the top, the two top rails and the downstream rails are still intact. And uh, it's the first example on the whole flume line that you walk up. We can actually see two towers together and uh, we did a little uh, video trick in the studio to show you a little bit better what this tower really looks like. And so I'm going to head back to the trail, back along the flume line and work my way up the Sidewinder Trail to the, to the next spot. So right on this uh, corner of this intersection, we're just above where a big landslide was quite a few years ago. Took out a huge chunk of the flume, but if you look down right below the trail, it's a good example of two towers still left, cross members, and the top rails are all still in place on those towers. From here on up, there's not a whole lot of flume to see. You gotta really watch 
you can see it on the way up. But uh, until we get up to the dam site, uh, the flume's getting more and more difficult to see. So we've reached the spot where the trail crosses over Gibson's Creek and it's a, it's a very solid bridge and it was put in a few years ago by volunteers and it follows pretty much the same path as the, the flume line. Now the original flume line trail was cut in by Fred Ingalls who was mapping the flume at that time and then the Sidewinder trail was put in a few years later by a group of enthusiastic mountain bikers who wanted to see a trail that ran from, well, Gibson's to Roberts Creek. One of the trails I pointed out on the map when we were at the bottom was the Cablevision Trail, and this is it. The Sidewinder Trail crosses over Cablevision right where the flume would have crossed over. The Cablevision uh, road was put in in the early, early 70s to carry the, uh, the cable that brought the signals from the towers on the mountain for the early Cablevision system. And uh, right here where I'm standing, there were, I remember as a child, five towers in a row all attached as part of the flume and uh, it's completely gone now. I'm going to keep heading up the Sidewinder Trail to the dam. Okay, I, I mentioned three trails on the way up and this is the, the trail from Keith Road up and this is the point where it crosses the Sidewinder Trail right at this drop off. And uh, we're almost at the dam now. We're still following the blue markers and uh, the blue markers went in uh, for a race called the Coast Challenge and this, uh, the blue markers actually follow a trail that'll take you all the way to uh, Porpoise Bay. And uh, just a, a note, we, as we were hiking up here, Marlene, the camera operator, mentioned that uh, this trail would be kid-friendly for her kids and they're, uh, they're still quite young. So uh, it's a fairly easy trail. We're just gonna hit the steepest part of the whole trail here now for about the next two minutes and then uh, we'll be right at the dam site. As you can see, there's lots of signs in this uh, big trail intersection here. We're just about at the dam. And uh, this is the end of the Sidewinder Trail. And uh, this is where we join onto Highway 102. Highway 102 North, actually, it runs from here all the way to Roberts Creek if you wanted to go that way and you'd end up at the uh, BNK Logging Road. We're gonna go just around the corner and down to the dam site now and uh, we're still following the blue markers. This is the top of the uh, Highway 102 trail where it intersects with the cemetery trail that comes up from just down here. So if you were to hike up the cemetery trail, you'd intersect this trail right by this sign. Head to the Highway 102 North, follow those blue markers. We're gonna take a real quick hike down the cemetery trail here. There's something really interesting I wanna show you down there. And it relates to this whole camp up here. When the workers and the materials came up to this camp, they came up a, a pole rail tramway. It was actually like a railroad, but the train cars, if you'd like to call them that, ran on poles that were made of smaller logs. There's a huge rail bed that runs all the way down to the cemetery. 
and uh, the rail was uh, pulled up by a big engine at the top and something just down here I want to show you. If you hiked up the trail from the cemetery, the first sign of the logging camps that you'd come to is this huge set of double flywheels. You can't miss them really, they're on the left hand side of the trail and they're pretty massive. They were once bolted to a single cylinder engine at the very top of the tram and the engine was used to pull the tram carts up and down the hill. Now how these flywheels actually came to rest here on the side of the hill is a bit of a mystery but the story that I heard was that a couple of teenage boys unbolted them from the engine and rolled them down here and that's where they've been ever since. If you're an engine buff, I did some measurements for you. The flywheels measure 75 inches across and I did a, a little measurement of the crankshaft down there and I, I got a piston stroke of uh, 20 inches. So uh, pretty significant engine and uh, what's even more significant is the engine still sits up there. Let's go up and have a look at that. Did I mention that the uh, cemetery trail was the steepest one? And unless you want a really good workout, this is definitely not the way to come up. This is a small section of the whole tramway that ran up from the cemetery and we're just a little bit below where the engine sits and just across from where the big wheels are. And just to give you some idea how long this has been here, this tree that's right above me here is growing right out of the center of the tramway so there's no possible way it could have been here when this tram was in operation so the cedars held up very well starting to show its age quite well but uh, the tree just gives you some idea it's pretty tall uh, this is what's left of the engine at the top of the tramway is a huge engine it was uh, originally uh, reported to be Fairbanks Morse but I uh, sent some photographs of the engine and the wheels off on a Google search and uh, we've uh, decided that it was probably English by the design of the wheels and uh, it was probably dragged up the mountain by some sort of animals or maybe it was uh, dragged up by itself uh, working its way up using a pulley. Now out of the front here there would have been a huge cylinder that went out uh, and a water jacket fit in here and the piston actually would have come right out through the back here and was attached to the crankshaft of the wheels that are down the hill. And they would have run in these bearings right in here and been bolted in. The, uh, the engine has a, a bore of about eight and a quarter inches. And uh, the piston stroke, as I said, was about 20 full inches. And uh, it would have given this uh, engine a displacement over 800 cubic inches or 14 liters. So it was a pretty hefty engine, probably ran on some sort of a, a diesel type fuel. Uh, and maybe not gasoline, the, the engine buffs on the internet told me that this was probably not gasoline but maybe diesel or um, another kind of a oil, they called it an oil engine in those days. Now I found this old bottle right here, right here at this site and um, I googled that as well and found out that it's, it's, it's not of the same age as the, as the engine, uh, probably about 1960, 60 to 65. And uh, you, can, you can tell some things f just from the age of it. It has no French on it. Uh, it it's measured in ounces and not, uh, not milliliters. High spot Canada dry. And, and you can find this, this bottle quite easily on the internet. Uh, I took the bottle from the site and took it home to study it. But I brought it back here. But I, I had a chance to visit uh, an archaeological site on uh, Mount Seymour where Bob Muckle, who's an instructor at Capilano College, is teaching a course on historical archaeology and I asked Bob you know what's the proper thing to do when you find something like this in the forest this is a prize this is what Bob had to say you find a bottle as a member of the public I would hope that they wouldn't that a member of the public wouldn't start collecting um, it's interesting um, and most people fortunately for archaeologists and historians and others interested in, in this sort of thing uh, most most members of the public don't want to maliciously destroy um, the uh, the site or the archaeological site or historic site or whatever it may be. Um, I would hope that they would leave them in place. Uh, once once any kind of bottle um, or any other kind of artifact is removed, um, the information for for those interested in the past is is really gone now. Um, 
if, if, if something is broken, it's the same. Even when people move things around um, in a site, um, it, it devalues the information for us. For archaeologists who are interested in piecing together the past, it's the context of all the artifacts that's really important to us. It's not finding bottle. The bottle doesn't really tell us that much by itself. It's what the bottle is found in association with. It's where it was found, how deep it was found, uh, how close to a tree it was found, <laughs> um, how close to a house it was found. Those are the things that are important to us. So when, when people go and they, t they take the bottles uh, or whatever, that, that's, for us that's just really sad because it, it takes away all that information. Um, when they move it around, which uh, happens occasionally, you can go through a site and uh, people have obviously you know, been through an area on a trail or bike or whatever, often you can find accumulations where somebody has pulled that stuff together. And that's interesting, certainly that's better than taking the artifacts. It's interesting, but we can't really learn an awful lot, uh, awful lot from that. We can tell that oh, it's more obvious to us that there was a site here, um, but we have no idea now of the arrangement of, of the site, how big the site was, um, where the garbage pile may have been as opposed to, you know, a, a house or something like that. Um, so it tells us the site is there, but the site's disturbed now, and so we've lost some information there as well. I mean, how often are people going into the forest to, to study these sites that are left over in the forest? <laughs> how often? Yeah. Um, yeah. From a professional point of view, I'm probably the only one doing it on a regular basis in British Columbia. As a, you know, trained as an archaeologist and most of my career has been spent, like almost every other archaeologist working in North America, and certainly in British Columbia, on prehistoric archaeology, the earliest um, archaeology, the archaeology of First Nations. Right now I'm the only archaeologist working on the more recent time period. Um, so when we, I'm the only one really looking right now for, for bottles and nails and things like that. Right now, I'm concentrating in the Seymour Valley, um, and that works. That works right now because it's a it's a manageable area to work in right now, and I think it's also important for this area because nobody's um, done it before. In North Vancouver, for example, we know quite a bit about um, their early history in Lynn Valley, and we know quite a bit about the, um, their early history um, in Capilano Valley, and the third major river valley. We know very little. So um, I find it very interesting from a research perspective and it's, uh, it's uh, quite accessible to my students, it's close to the college, it works for a number of reasons, uh, for, those, for those reasons. I started off only giving tours on, on weekends to the members of the public and I'd take them up and we'd spend a couple of hours um, at, at a site, at the, primarily the logging camp site and I'd be informing them about the nature of, of what we're doing, um, a little bit about local history the project itself focuses on local history and um, about my research questions, what, what I'm trying to find out and then how, how we're going about answering those questions, like how, why it is that we're opening an excavation unit right here, what I hope to find out. They try to tell the public what my decision process has been and, wh you know, and what we're hoping to gain and what our next plan is. Um, so, so typically, I've, I've always started with a tour of the site, the overall site. The site, you know, that we've had the public um, at the last few years, you know, it's a pretty big site. It's about the size of a football field. Um, so we're walking around through the bush, um, giving my interpretations, um, and then giving people an opportunity to excavate. Uh, we've been doing for the last few years under very close supervision, supervision of myself and um, field school students, former field school students. Um, who are watching closely um, because, again, you don't want to just let people go with shovels. So uh, the field school students, by the time we had the public programs, were all well versed in the techniques of excavation and how to excavate and how to record and the importance of context. Um, so we have a very good ratio. There's uh, typically you know, about, two, about uh, two members of the public excavating for every student close at hand. Um, and we have them fairly close together, so and, you know, and, and I'm wandering around as well. Um, um, it's a, I think it's an exciting opportunity uh, for people of all ages. Um, I think the range of ages that we've had for the public it ranges probably from about 6 to about 80 um, over the last few years, and they all seem to enjoy it. Uh, I hope eventually to expand it to other areas of Greater Vancouver and the Sunshine Coast. Um, I've taught, you know, in Seashell before, and I've had many students who tell me about all the archaeological sites there, and I have a number of students 
here uh, from Sea Shell Ten Gibsons and other areas of the Sunshine Coast who, who commute to this college. And they frequently tell me about all the uh, historic archaeological sites on the Sunshine Coast. And I've had, let's see, at least four or five students from the Sunshine Coast on the archaeology field school over the last few years who invariably tell me about all the archaeological sites of historic interest um, in the Sunshine Coast. So I'd hope to get up to the Sunshine Coast. How long does the site last in the forest? Well, this is, what's, this is something that's really interesting to me. They don't last very long. <laughs> um, you know, f for the last 25 years, I was doing, uh, you know, prehistoric archaeology, and I had really no idea about the nature of uh, historic archaeology, particularly how fast the sites can disappear, um, uh, you know, how fast trees grow. <laughs> it's, it was all new to me. Um, Depending on what the what the site uh, was constituted of, of uh, you know, entire site can disappear uh, just through natural processes in the order of 50 or 60 years. I've talked to a number of foresters over the last few years who I assume are much more knowledgeable than me about you know how fast uh, wood structures may decompose, and um, they tell me in the environments that I'm working that it's not unreasonable to expect any kind of building that was made from fir or hemlock in the Seymour Valley, you know, wouldn't last more than 60 or 70 years tops. Um, so you could have standing structures, you know. So for example, so at one of the logging camps that I've been dealing with the last few years, I find a, a lot of uh, cedar and, I, um, and it looks like to be in arrangements of uh, uh, house foundations for floorboards, for example, and maybe walkways. But I see nails everywhere throughout them. And, I, and I've asked a number of foresters, would it be reasonable to think that I might be looking at a composite structure, perhaps built of um, cedar, fir, and hemlock, the three dominant species in the valley? And they all tell me absolutely that uh, fir and hemlock are, are not nearly as durable as, uh, or they're not nearly uh, as likely to last as long as cedar, which I understood as well, but I didn't realize how much or how fast fir and hemlock can uh, just totally de uh, decompose in, in the natural environment. So um, in terms of wood structures, they can be gone very, qu very quickly. And also over the last few years, as a, uh, we, we look at the same sites, if particularly in an area where there was cabins and, um, and houses and a couple of stores. Every year I go to monitor to see what's gone from year to year to year. And uh, it's amazing to me that um, I, I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but I think it, you know, it would be reasonable to say, like, for, based on my experience here the last four years in the Seymour Valley, um, some of the sites along the, the river are losing about 10% of their artifacts every year. Um, to the, when I say losing, I mean losing their visibility. They're either eroding into the, into the river or they're being covered by the leaves and just being buried. Um, you know, those leaves eventually turn to soil. Um, so it, that, that's one thing that really um, astounded me, was how fast these sites can change and how will disappear, be removed from visibility. And of course we have a big problem with uh, people looting the sites as well. Is there anything to protect other than public education? Is there anything to protect a site? Um, you, a site can be designate, uh, designated uh, as a heritage site by the provincial government. Um, Is that difficult to do? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Yeah, that's difficult to do, but that's the that's that's the route to go. Um, if somebody finds an archaeological site and they think it's it's uh, worthy of protection, it's the the government of BC can designate it as a heritage site, and then it will be protected by legislation, just like the the pre eighteen forty six sites will be. So, if you're going to save these sites, then um, how can the the general public get involved in in sort of helping that to happen? What I recommend is that people become affiliated somehow with uh, some kind of community organization. Because I think if you get your, whether it's museum or a municipality or, or a district of some sort, um, I believe there's actually you know, funding available from the provincial government to keep a registry. Um, I'm assuming it's still available. I mean, it was the last time I, I looked on the government website that they will actually fund, maybe not completely, but uh, with, a, with a sharing agreement, that they'll come up with money if, uh, if a community uh, wants to uh, make a register of historic sites, um, that they will, they will come up with some money to help that happen. I just, what do you feel is the, the, the future of these small sites that are quickly being eaten up by the forest and how, oh, I, how long have we well, got? Well that's interesting, that's, a, that's an interesting um, comment or question. I think the, I think the future in archaeology is uh, community archaeology. It's an emerging subfield of archaeology. Um, 
that there's only actually been one book published, and that was just with a few months ago. And um, the project I've been doing in Seymour Valley really fits neatly into this community archaeology. It's working closely with communities, uh, which hasn't, hasn't happened in archaeology before. Um, and it's just starting to now uh, around the world. Um, we're just on the, on the verge now, and I think uh, it's a good partnership that the, the that archaeologists working with local communities with with the me, meeting the interests of both, right? For example, you, um, archaeologists generally want to be focused on some kind of research question, and, and that's easy to do in community archaeology. And members of the community want um, more of a say in um, in the local community resources and what happens to them, how they're managed. Um, they at least want to know what's there. It's important to know uh, for a community, I think, you know, whether resources are there, whether, they're, whether they are significant. If you're going to have a development, at least you should know that something's there. Um, so I actually think the future, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future. I think that um, there will be a lot more community archaeology projects being, you know, initiated by members of the community and uh, with archaeologists participating. Go ahead. If you get up to the dam site, you'll notice there's a huge amount of alder trees up here. The alders uh, on the coast are one of the first trees to take hold of an area that's been cleared. And if you see a huge stand of alders like this, it's pretty obvious that there was once a huge clearing here and something was here. And this is, uh, this is the site of the camp right here. The big alder trees in the area played a big part in helping Fred Ingalls create this map in 1989. Fred spent a great deal of time on the mountain, hiking back and forth, and measuring and recording the information to create this map. And I had a chance to talk to him about what he went through to actually put it together. Well, when I was, when I was mapping large trees, it was, it was during uh, the period when I was mapping first camp itself. And that's, that had to do with, a tree can't, can't be of a certain age <laughs> if, if something was there prior to that time. So, uh, the, the significance of the large trees was it helped, it helped set the period of when the last time humans were there and cutting down trees. Um, that was the significance for me when I was mapping first cap. It gave me a sense of which period I was looking at when I was in that particular portion of first camp. You know, which, which, whether it referred to the sawmill period or the shingle bolt period, which was 20 years later, roughly. Well, well I, when I started trying to, when I was trying to put together the map uh, of first camp, which I wanted to do to try and understand the way the operation worked. Um, in, in that, I mean, it's difficult to do mapping by yourself and measuring by yourself. So I, there was, and there was other people involved that were, got me interested. I mean, John Hindsmith got me interested. George Smith got me interested. And, uh, and I had, so those, those two uh, people were doing, they were doing their, their own investigation and I was trying to put it, compile it into, a, into a, something that other people could appreciate, a kind of, some kind of map. And then, so they helped me to a point, and then I was kind of got my own interest built up, and I carried on, and uh, I had other help, and Mole helped me for a while. Um, so that was, uh, and eventually I got a chance to get enough information that I could actually draft up, essentially a, a plan of, of what I was able to find. Uh, when I was doing it, there wasn't an awful lot left, and you had to go by uh, references, I could find some corner posts and uh, a ridge line here and there that had fallen to the ground. Uh, I could find the old engine for the tram and uh, some of the uh, woodworking that would be the platform that, that the uh, engine was sitting on, that sort of thing was what I was able to find. And of course the, the dam is there, still there, that is there was remains of the dam still there. And the old boiler from the original 1903 uh, uh, sawmill, uh, that remains of that boiler is still up there. So meant that there was enough evidence to tie together a real sense of what was there. Um, but there was a couple of bunk houses and they had a cook house. And you know, we had essentially people were living up there and staffing this, this operation. And uh, they'd be able to come down if they, you know, they would, take, they would take the tram down or up. I remember my dad being in that tram car um, back in, I guess it would have been, well, I guess it would have been 19, mid, early 1920s. Uh, and uh, taking a ride up with with his dad, just for the fun of it, uh, I guess. Although maybe maybe someone was sick up there, and uh, my grandfather had to go up and take care of somebody. I can't remember the details on that. But uh, so there was like a like a mini village up there that had to be more or less self-sustained, and food and supplies would come up the tram, and uh, and supply them so they could carry on work there. You know, uh, every day of the week essentially, when they, unless they got a day off. 
in my interest in in uh, mapping it out was mapping out uh, first camp was was to uh, to keep a record because you know, like I've forgotten a lot of this stuff even from you know a few years ago when I was doing that actually it's almost 15 years ago or so now but but uh, at the time it, the idea was that it'd be some record of uh, of the effort and the, and the and the style of doing things a flume is an amazingly efficient way to move material off a mountain you don't have to build any roads and the water and, and gravity does all the work so if you you know if you've got the material to build the flumes it, as long as you got water and you got gravity which is gravity can give it's a given and the water should keep happening as long as it keeps raining so the cost of building a road is prohibitive compared to putting a flume up and if, as long as you've got source of material at the top end of the flume it makes real good sense to use them so it was an interesting thing that they could actually use you know this kind of medieval uh, technology to to move huge amounts of material off the mountain and uh, so that was that was of interest and just and just the fact that you know my family has some connection with the history of the town not not the operation per se of, of the shingle boat thing but but you know my father and my grandfather would have been interacting with those people all the time and they're just part of the my history too so so I wanted to make some sort of permanent record of it and it was an intellectual interest to see if I could even do it and come up with something that was worth looking at and, and you know I made the effort and others can judge that. I think it's it's of interest to everybody to, to check it out just to see how how absurd in some ways how difficult it might have been to be able to do these things and how ingenuity how much ingenuity they would have had to have to actually pull off an operation like this and make money at it. Um, so that's you know that's that's of interest I think it's uh, so I mean, if people going up there now would would see less and less as as these wooden uh, structures return to the forest. But uh, it's worth going up to see, and you know maybe uh, we can do an enhanced illustration of these maps or something. Some you know might be something people could look at when they're up there, and they could make some sense of where they are relative to you know what they're seeing. You know, especially because the old boiler will be there forever. It's too heavy to move and. And the flywheel's so buried in the ground, no one's going to want to move it. So it's it's interesting. I think that people can go out there and actually see some history. Yeah. Okay, when I was a kid and I hiked up here the very first time, I remember there actually being buildings still remaining on this site. Uh, that was a little more than 30 years ago, and uh, thanks to Fred and his map, you can still see the layout of the land and some of the locations where the buildings actually were and I've just marked the four corners of this this building here and I'm kind of over here through the bushes at the far corner we're just uh, not 30 feet from the from the engine and uh, if you're very careful and you use your imagination a little bit you can actually see the corners of the buildings and the what would have been the roof trusses at that time that have just kind of collapsed into the into the site I'll leave these markers here in case anybody comes up they can find this little building okay so here we are we made it to the big dam at the top now this dam was the site of two flumes that ran down this mountain. The first flume ran down Chester Creek, and this is Chester Creek. It crosses the highway at Henry Road and empties into the ocean at, uh, at Chester Park down in the Gower Point area. Now the flume ran down Chester Creek and apparently cut over and emptied out into the Bay and Gibsons. And then the second flume ran down from Chester Creek across the mountain all the way down to Langdale, and that's the flume that we walked up. In 1903, Drew Battle built a steam sawmill on this site, and he ran the flume line down Chaster Creek, and, which emptied eventually into the Bay and Gibsons. Now, the steam sawmill ran until 1906, where a huge fire ripped through this area and took out the sawmill and everything else that was around it. There's still a few relics of that sawmill here, and we can have a look around and see what we can find. Uh, this little crankshaft here is part of uh, what was left of the old steam mill that was here and it just kind of sits here in the forest waiting to be discovered and if you walk over here this is a real interesting part this is actually the boiler from that steam sawmill and it, it's, a, it's a pretty significant piece of history that sits up here in the mountain the uh, the pipes from the inside of the boiler have all rotted away but you can see that the squirrels have made nests inside but still quite a quite a piece of steel that sits up here and over here I'm just gonna walk through the bushes is the big flywheel that was the center of that uh, steam engine and it would have spun probably a big pulley or a big belt and uh, a couple more pieces of this engine are down there in the in the bushes the center axle of the uh, flywheel some turnbuckles and a few other interesting little artifacts left up here so after the after the sawmill was destroyed by the fire in 1906 the Stoltz shingle bolt 
company built a shingle bolt plant up here in 1919 and they sent shingle bolts down the mountain on the other flume, the one that we hiked up into Langdale until 1923. So as I mentioned, the dam actually survived the fire and this dam was actually filled with earth and the logs were laid in by hand and it was filled with dirt and they, it held the water back. It's the same dam that was used by the, the Drew Battle sawmill, but in 1919, the Stoltz Shingle Bolt factory came up here and they used the same dam and built another flume and this was the base of their shingle bolt operation. Now from here, shingle bolts came in from all directions, across the dam and straight up the mountain there was a tram, another one similar to the one below that ran on rails and was pulled up by an engine and carts moved the shingle bolts up and down. Further up in this direction there was another camp and it was called Japanese Camp. They dammed Gibson's Creek and they brought all their shingle bolts down into the back side of this dam on another flume and then further up in this direction there was another camp that was known as Chinese Camp and they used a clothesline type operation to move their shingle bolts down and it would have been a pulley at the top, a pulley at the bottom, a cable in the middle and they hang their shingle bolts off and they'd come down the hill uh, in a real hurry. All the shingle bolts were eventually pulled into the back of this side of the dam. A gate would be closed and water would be raised up in here and this whole area would be filled with water in a big pond. They'd open the gate and through a, a hole in the center of the dam they'd pull the shingle bolts and they'd go into the flume down the mountain 2% grade, remember, all the way to Langdo. So we're going to cross the bridge here and head up and have a look at the, uh, the tram line that ran up the mountain on the far side. Okay? We're just a couple of hundred meters above the dam and we come to an intersection where Highway 102 intersects and heads, it says north, to Roberts Creek. And there's another sign above it that says red up to Wicked Ditches. And Wicked Ditches is a, a local name uh, for the what used to be the BNK logging road. And they've cut huge ditches in. And it's a bit of a nasty ride on your bicycle. And if you look on the far tree there, there's a sign that says Tramway Trail. And that's the trail we're going to hike up. The reason it's called red is because Fred Ingalls used these red markers to uh, mark the trail on the way up. And it's always been known as the Red Trail to the mountain bikers and it's the tramway trail to the historians. So let's go up the tramway trail to the top. If it sounds like I'm breathing hard a little bit, it's because we've been climbing the tramway trail for quite some time and it's a significant climb. It's only a kilometer long from the dam, but it rises 250 meters in that kilometer. That's a 25% grade and that's considerably steeper than School Road in Gibson. So you should have some idea what it's like. It's about a third as steep again for a full kilometer. Now you can see easily that the cut line goes right through the trees here and it just continues on straight up. Some of the smaller trees have taken over so it's starting to grow in a little bit but this is a good spot to get some idea what a dead straight line to the top it looks like. And uh, at the very top there was an engine again pulled with a pulley and uh, that's where we're going. Thanks to Fred Ingalls the red markers mark this trail really well. But uh, as you can see behind me, a group of very enthusiastic and energetic mountain bikers have taken over some of this trail for themselves and they've built one of the most challenging free ride trails on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, they, it's known locally as the Red Trail and uh, we're pretty close to the top now. Uh, if you did take the time to hike all the way up, you'd find some really interesting artifacts on the way and uh, that's why we're going all the way to the top in this hike. Just above all those mountain bike stunts that you just saw and nestled in amongst the trees is this axle shaft and wheel and it's one of three wheels you'll find if you do make the hike up to the top. And you can see by the construction of the wheel that it actually was rounded on the inside and that was so that it could run on the small pole logs that they used as the rails. The distance between the, uh, between the wheels would have been about four feet and uh, as far as I can find out the carts were about four, five feet wide and 16 feet long. So they carried a lot of weight in shingle bolts as they went down this hill at the end of the cable. So there's more. Okay, so this wheel that you're looking at uh, marks the top of the red trail and uh, the top of the red trail ends on this road right here. If you were to travel to your left as you reach the top of the trail, you'd hit eventually the BNK logging road and be able to hike down into Roberts Creek. If you were to travel in the other direction, 
you'd hit the Cablevision Road and you'd be able to hike back down that way. Back down the hill, about 900 meters is the dam, but remember I said the, the uh, tramway ran a kilometer, so that means there's still 100 meters to go up there. It's not a traveled trail, but there's something really interesting to find at the top. This old engine at the very top of the tram is a pretty significant part of the history on the mountain and it's definitely one of the most exciting parts of the hike all the way to the top. As far as I'm concerned, it's well worth the hike just to find this old beast. It, uh, it looks like it might be Fairbanks Morse. It could be a national. And I'm gonna take some of the photographs we took today back to those uh, engine buffs and see if we can find a little bit more information about it. But there's five head bolts and a big spoked wheel. The, other spoked wheel is broken off, but the, the piece lies down, scattered around in the, in the forest here. It's the engine that probably pulled the tram up and down the hill. It probably worked long and hard. The bore of the, the piston is about eight inches and it had a, a displacement of, uh, if you want to measure it in liters, about, about eight and a half liters. So it's a pretty big engine. W probably uh, worked pretty hard and would have made a great sound up here in the forest back in its day. There's uh, a couple more things down at the old dam site that I'm going to hike down and have a look at and, uh, and head down the mountain after that. Before we close the show, I wanted to bring you down just below the dam site and show you this piece of the flume. It's now the only piece of the flume on the mountain where more than two towers are connected and it gives you a pretty good example of the grade that the flume took and the construction that was used in order to build it. Time's running out for the historical camps on Mount Elphinstone. The remains of the tram and the flume are nearly wiped out and the buildings are all but gone. Who knows how many more years are left for people to come and explore before the camps are lost completely. Over the next few months, we'll visit some other sites on the Sunshine Coast. An old home site on Homesite Creek and one of the old shake cutters cabins in the mountains in Roberts Creek. I hope this show inspires you to visit the old dam site on Elphinstone and take a look around and see what's left of the camp before it's too late, before the bushes, the salmon berries and the trees take over and you can't see the history for the trees. <laughs>